Hello everyone and welcome back to my Beyond History series in Kerbal Space Program 1.1.3 and in this episode we begin with a bit of a problem. Now we ended the previous episode with a bit of a problem too and that was that we had potentially stranded Philippe on the surface of Mars but we have a somewhat bigger problem this time because I can't turn to Philippe's pod, Ares Pod G landed on Mars without it tipping over and generally exploding something. Now Ares Pod G if it explodes something on one side but not on the other side, that's a problem because then it's imbalanced and the Gemini lander engines that we used uh, on it uh, cannot gimbal. So, and the RCS is not powerful enough to compensate for any sort of severe chain, you know, uh, gap in the COM if it, the COM is off to one side. So, yeah, well, maybe this time when I turn to it, it won't be a problem. Uh, of course, I zipped up the save at the end of the previous episode so I can restore the persistent file at any time. So that's a good thing. And so basically that's what I've been doing. Uh, I've been turn turning to it. Uh, it explodes. And um, I restored the persistent file and try again or try something a little bit different. I tried uh, using Alt F12, uh, you know pause on vessel unpack, unbreakable joints, no crash damage. Um, no crash damage could be helpful, I think. Let's try it without those first, and then I'll try it with them. After all, this is a glitch. We're just compensating for a glitch. And so I feel justified in using whatever cheats necessary to keep the thing intact and in the state it was at the end of the previous episode. Okay, uh, uh, so it automatically turns to like 90 degrees, which is not good. You, did you see that? Uh, it, it seemed to load in the right direction, and then it turned 90 degrees. It was like a flat 90 degrees. It wasn't even, it wasn't even fair at all. Um, um, while it's here, I guess we can investigate certain possibilities. But I'll probably, I'll be reloading. Actually, you know what? Um, Maybe we should just get rid of the other landing legs. Those are pretty heavy. Um, but we'll have to do that in a sec. So, Philippe is a pilot and cannot uh, demolish things. If we have him pop out and try and have him uh, get rid of this little stub, for instance, uh, that is not going to work. Only engineers can do that. We can use uh, Ship Manifest to dump our wastewater. Lithium hydroxide, waste. Let's see what we can do with this, but I'm definitely going to be reloading the the persistent file. We got hack gravity. I'm not gonna have unbreakable joints. We'll do that on a different test. This is going to be a test of how we can break this properly. Uh, so we're gonna use some of our fuel and try and knock those. I don't suppose there's any way we can like destroy the additional landing leg, is there? Probably not. Well, let's just do the basic thing and make sure we're turned in the right direction. And what we're going to do is we're going to push off and then re-establish gravity. Um, unhack gravity. Now we got a little bit of a benefit, but we also had to do a little bit of RCS work to get there. so. A lot of RCS is going to just compensating for the missing landing leg. Uh, now it's stopped. Uh, you know what? We could put some fuel in these tanks over here to compensate and lock it. That would be a good idea. Okay, so hold on a sec. Um, we're going to reload and we're going to try... Oh wait, maybe I could just do it right now. We've got some time to apoapsis. We're just gonna see how close we are to getting to orbit, but we're not gonna be that close. On the other hand, this was completely messed up. Yeah, next time we'll have to redistribute the fuel in the tanks a little bit earlier to compensate for, and then we won't have to use so much RCS to rebalance. But then again, uh, if we actually want to use this fuel, 
eventually, which we do, we will have to we will have to unlock it, and then we're going to have a balance issue. Or we could just use RCS to do that part of the burn, but still, we're, we're going to have a balance issue. Okay, that's the end of what we have now. We've got an apoapsis outside of the atmosphere. The question is, how much delta V would we need to actually make orbit? 600. Well, that's close enough for now. So, how much if we unlock um, this fuel? 193. Now, the trajectory was sloppy, and if anything, we would really like to get rid of these landing struts. But again, uh, Philippe being a pilot cannot do that. I looked and I wanted to find out if I could give pilots the ability to do that. I looked at KAS and KIS. Couldn't find any setting for that. It might be baked in. We can probably explode the solar panels. It will diminish how much electric charge we have left, but actually the Kerbals can survive a little bit of time without electric charge as well. Same with the antenna. But as you can see, I mean, I'll just uh, doubly verify. Let's get outside. Okay, and if I try and do disassemble part, no luck. I guess, well no, I can't bring it into inventory either because that also requires an engineer to use a drill to bring it into inventory, so that's not an option either. I mean, I guess we can shut down this engine. The center of mass, uh, oh wait, the center of mass is going to be further on this side because we've got a lack of stuff here. So if I shut down this engine, maybe it'll be balanced. There's a theory for you. Uh, that's five in a row and then one on this side. Okay, here we go again. I really wonder whether it's not just better to have it knock off a few extra parts. It seems to knock off the solar panels anyway. I'd rather lose the landing legs, especially since it doesn't seem like we can safely uh, get upright and turn on gravity again uh, because there's that one landing leg that decides to flip us anyway, right? Uh, if I extend the landing legs and we try and restore gravity for some reason, that landing leg glitches out and we flip around and we, we, we get launched up. Alright, let's see. Okay, pop up. That's pretty high up this time. Uh, let's hope it doesn't... Oh... Yeah, I was sort of worried about that. Okay, let's try that again. Okay, well, we'll see what kind of state it's in this time. It's possible that we're going to have to just uh, start our way to orbit immediately on the hop. But I don't know if I'll be able to control it very well. Uh, that's pretty far. Uh, no, that's not going to do very well. No, I can't write it in time. Oh. Alright, considering that the vehicle is being thrown up into the air to a height that will destroy the pod, I think I have to go with unbreakable joints and no crash damage. That will at least keep it safe until it hits the ground. I really don't have the ability to turn it using the RCS when it's mid-air and flipping around like that. Uh, the RCS is just not powerful enough to stop that kind of rotation. So, yeah, we don't really have much of a choice. Okay, it's up in the air. Um... Let me, maybe I can retract, uh, oh, I can't, no, no, <laughs> I can't get that solar panel, uh, I think they're all broke off, that's good, I guess, because it's nice and even. On the other hand, I really would have liked the landing struts to break off instead, but with the unbreakable joints and no crash damage, that was unlikely to happen. Okay, uh, well, let's do this thing, but I won't try and dump the water, because that seems to cause the sound glitch. Still, 3600 is not going to be enough to make orbit, but I want to know exactly how far off we are, potentially, so that we can get a sense of what other possibilities might be useful. 
There's, that, there's always that one landing leg that wants to stick out a little bit ahead and will cause problems if we allow it to. Okay, um, I don't need those. I'll hack gravity. RCS on. Okay, well, um, thing is, if I extend the landing legs, it's going to pop me up again. And if I turn on hack gra uh, turn off hack gravity with the landing legs in, we'll probably crash into the ground. I don't know if we can balance properly like this. So I will have to ignite first and then unhack gravity. So let's do it. Okay, I did that quickly enough so it shouldn't have been too big a deal. We are balanced this time, so it's nice. That is a relief. We haven't locked any tanks this time. So what we've got displayed is what we've got. Is it possible to get a more optimal trajectory? Yes, I think so. And right now, as far as reaching orbit is concerned, and actually there is more drag here than I thought there would be. So that's worth noting. Uh, we're about 400 shy. Okay, so let's have our Kerbal EVA and RCS and I think that's the right direction, yeah. Oh, so once the Kerbal's on EVA, it's a limited amount of time before the oxygen runs out, right? Though Delta V-wise, it's looking pretty darn good. We could toss Philippe really high, and then maybe the light lander can do a quick rendezvous. That'll take a lot of practice, though. Um, so that's approximately orbit. Uh, 141 meters per second only. So basically, the jetpack had close to 300, which is good to know. But this is not the way we're going to do it exactly. I really need to figure out how to strip just a little bit more mass off of the lander. Um, we got rid of all the solar panels, or maybe got rid of all the solar panels. Uh, but maybe we should just make sure that we can dump all but this amount of food, water, and oxygen, right? Because this is all he's going to be able to carry anyway. So we don't need the extra food, water, and oxygen that he can't carry with him in the EVA suit. So that's the thought. Anyway, so this is the problem. Basically, the, the first problem is uh, Philippe can't strip stuff off of the craft. Second, actually, is a part partway solution in that the, the game sure can break stuff uh, by flipping us and deciding not to load us properly. So exactly how we manage that situation will determine our ability to make orbit as well. But uh, so far, this is um, as close as I'm getting. Okay, so I have presumably turned Philippe into an engineer. Let's check. Um, Philippe is now an engineer. Um, hopefully that has worked out. So I guess that's the way we're going to we're going to do this. We, we'll see. Uh, let me turn to him and make sure nothing else goes wrong, and I'll do it the same way that I did last time. Okay, it has happened again exactly the way it happened the previous times. <laughs> ah, okay, and we're on our side, and I'm just going to have Philip EVA. Let's uh, just assemble that. I have not hacked gravity yet. Okay, and yep, disassemble that. Um, can I get to the one at the bottom? Yes. Great range on the disassembly, by the way. Okay, the docking port. Um, forget if the RCS thrusters are attached to it. They sh it shouldn't be. I don't think there's a collider on that bit. Right. Uh, parachutes. Let me have him board. I need to move the fuel up. Actually, 
even without exploding the landing struts, we seem to be pretty well off uh, having gotten rid of the parachutes in particular. I think this is pretty good. Alright, forward. Okay, so now we've done that. We dump carbon dioxide. I don't know if that will even give us one meter per second. Oh, there's one. The wastewater is the water is always the most serious part. And that uh, if I could safely dump the water, that'd be super. Okay, well, okay, I dumped uh, 34 units of water, and I'm gonna take that because it's not making noise right now. So good, we'll we'll go with that. Okay, all the 12 at gravity. Uh, RCS on. Firm footing here. Unhack gravity. Okay, so we've read the pod without, and and now I can launch like this with. Uh, let me undo the other. So it's a clean launch. So the only thing that I've actually done to help this situation is hack gravity to write the pod because we did land upright. So it was just a glitch causing us to land sideways. Not like the glitch causing that pole to just stay there. Um, and then give the Philippe the ability to remove parts. And that's about it. So I think that's a satisfactory way to go. And now it's just down to me not messing up the launch. Part of the problem is that we're actually pointed in a wrong direction. We need to be pointed towards 90. We're currently pointed towards 270 because of the slope. Okay. All right. Here goes nothing. Links in. Still not the best launch profile I could have imagined. Okay, we should just go in line. I think 1.3 degrees is as low a relative inclination as I can manage. Okay, well, 140 is quite enough. Let's see, we've got 1,500 meters per second left. And it'll be enough. But perhaps we should give some thought as to our phasing with the target. It's not great right now. We have some delta V left, but we don't have... Uh, it's just electric charge is really a pain. Kerbals can also survive for a while without electric charge, so that's true. And especially since we have Philippe in the pod, I, I'll check exactly how long they have without electric charge before they die. Uh, that's in attack life support. But even though my heart is still heavy on this, we have managed to get him back to orbit. Or he's managed to get himself back to orbit. Stripping enough parts off of this. And that is orbit. Okay. So let me pause this. And l let me quickly check TAC life support. And it says max time without electricity is 2,000... Uh, no, 259,200. I don't know if... Uh, if that is changed by realism overhaul, but that means 72 hours. So, actually, Philippe would be able to survive for 72 hours without electricity in this capsule by default with uh, TAC life support. Now, if realism overhaul changes that, I don't know. Part of the problem with the Ares Pod G is just that it was consuming more electric, uh, more electric charge than it ought to. Two kilowatts. That's all its fuel cells. That's the max its fuel cells could generate. It probably actually consumed less than that because you want redundancy. The fuel cells generated two kilowatts in total. Okay, that should be good enough on the periapsis. Now let's do some plotting. Okay, I've plotted a maneuver at uh, at periapsis for 275.6 meters per second and it says that we can actually rendezvous with Philippe in four hours so that's excellent I mean um, if we saw the solar panels on the pod I think the, it wouldn't even have run out of electric charge at, in that time so I think this is good and we'll use 500 for that altogether after matching speeds so we'll still have 1500 left over 
It occurs to me, I'm not entirely sure what good pilots are in RP0. Because, you know, I mean, we launched off the surface. I didn't use Smart ASS or anything for the launch. And with Philippe as an engineer, it didn't really cause any problems, did it? Because we had the other controller on, and we generally do have another controller on. This pod, too, we have an, a Gina core. So... Hmm. <laughs> um, pilots are fairly useless altogether, it would seem. I mean, the, the, the thing is, of course, in real life, the test pilots were had engineering background. It's not like they wouldn't have been able to do some basic stuff, even welding and such. Heck, you don't even need to be an engineer to do welding and use a drill or whatever you need to do to get parts off. Now, there's no docking port on the Ares Pod G, so we'll just match velocities with it and have Philippe EVA over. Turns out those parachutes and that docking port were heavier than I thought they were. Especially the parachutes are probably really heavy and... And that's why we were able to get the extra Delta V we needed. So yeah, if you're planning a Mars mission of your own, maybe send a few of these out. <laughs> Something like this. Just in case. In the future, we might uh, just make the whole taking off parts off the Ares Pod G. The parachute, well, the thing is, I wanted it to be reusable. That's why I wanted the parachutes to stay on. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll figure it out. It can be improved. I think it needs more of a fully conic shape than a cone and then a box. I mean, not box, a cylinder. Making it a full cone would be better. There are complications with that, then there's a reason it had this shape, but we'll see. Okay, I think we're close enough for for the EVA here. So yes, this was more of a boots on the ground sort of Mars mission. But at least it wasn't a Kerbal stuck on the ground Mars mission. Okay, he is in. We've got some serious electric charge consumption. Well, I mean, but uh, a lot of that will go away once we are back in daylight. So, set Mars Port 1 as our target. And uh, maneuver there. Technically, we have enough uh, Delta V for this approach. So we're going to boost higher than the station first and then bring it back down again to rendezvous over here. It says 12 kilometers. I... we could probably manage better than that if we aim for it. That's 5.6 and combined our burns will be about well less than 1,200 so that works. And that'll be in six hours when we actually arrive at the station. So all in all um, all of this will have happened in a day. Marsport 1 is also a great thing. I'm certainly glad we've sent something like that over here. Retracting the panels now so that we don't destroy them by bumping them into something. I mean, Marsport 1 and this uh, light lander are just going to hang out here and be reusable. Marsport 1 took a full Saturn V ish launcher. This did not. This uh, required much less, of course. So yeah, I'm just going to keep Philippe as an engineer. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's for the best. He's certainly earned his stripes, as far as that's concerned. Yep, wandering. App docked. All right. Philippe is back with Newcast. A slight change to his vocation. But everything is looking good. We are uh, we are recharging. Our station is properly poised towards the sun. And yeah, I'll I'll leave the Aries Pod G where it is right now. I think it might have enough delta V to deorbit, and it does still have its own controller, so it's possible to deorbit it. It's not going to have electric charge for very long. Uh, actually, it probably should have run out by now. Uh, but yeah. Anyway, 
I don't know what you think of all this, uh, but I was sort of glad to have this little adventure. I would have been very disappointed with this whole Mars experience if there wasn't something like this. I didn't think it would be as close a parallel to the Martian as it ended up being. It's not exactly. Of course, we didn't grow potatoes, but you know, you know what I mean. Uh, so, yeah. And I have learned that we should just carry engineers. <laughs> we should just carry engineers. There's, there's no reason. We've got We've got controllers on basically everything except for the uh, Ares Pod A. I think this... Um, uh, uh, we have a decoupler there. I don't think we have a separate controller. We, so we'll need at least one pilot for that. But otherwise, um, the vehicles all have their own controllers. Okay, I have time warp to the return window, the window from Mars to Earth. And we are now 21 hours away. Okay, so it's finished rebalancing the food, water, and oxygen, and if we take a look, it says we have a year and 300 days worth of food, water, and oxygen on Mars Port 1. Uh, that ends up being, more. let's just say, more than 600 days for margin. And uh, that is 8,000 food gives us that much life support. So if we take a look at in here, uh, this is the actual uh, main life support tank. And here we have more than 4,000, so we have more than half of the food, water, and oxygen of the station in Ares Pod A itself, so we have more than 300 days worth. Uh, now this is meant to uh, capture using this heat shield, so it separates at this decoupler. And that'll be good, because this of course only had enough ablator for Mars capture. And so we'll be shedding all of this, and then we'll just be a little uh, Gemini capsule and the docking port, and hopefully that'll be good enough. This is says. Uh, this is the best heat tolerance we can expect out of a heat shield in uh, in Kerbal Space Program with Realism Overhaul right now. The Soyuz heat shield is uh, is a lunar rated heat shield, just like uh, the other lunar rated heat shields. So hopefully it'll be enough, but I don't know. I am nervous about that, but at least we're not trying to like capture all of this. Though it would have been mostly empty by the time we get there, right? Uh, the actual heat shield loading would have been comparatively low since this will be empty. And this will be mostly empty, so yeah. Um, no, let's do ASAP. Hmm, 2,500 and it wants us to burn there. Okay, let's verify that we have enough. Oh, wow, we have a year and a few days. So we really should get some of that back in here, but let's just get on with it. We're sending more supplies soon anyway. Well, let's verify exactly how much fuel we have here. 3,000, okay, actually it has 3,000 meters per second. We could exit on the trajectory that's given us. Hmm. And the reason, I, I thought we had less, but of course that was calculated with the full food, water, and oxygen tanks. This has depleted most of its food, water, and oxygen, so now it has a lot more delta V. So let's take a look at this orbit. So we're exiting here says Earth encounter in 340 days. Well, that seems pretty slow, isn't it? Maybe that's good. I mean, we have the food, water, and oxygen, right? We certainly have 340 days worth. And this is a nice slow approach, I think. And we'll have enough food, water, and oxygen, so maybe we'll do this. Right? Right. Yeah, let's not have any more complicated redocking or anything like that. Let's lock this fuel for now. It's still enough. When you look at this, it's quite a rough burn we're aiming for here. And of course, it's the whole idea that uh, it pretends that it's all going to be instantaneous. Mm, now we got a point at Mars Port 1. Not quite. Close, but not quite. All right. Well, here goes nothing. Ignition. Mars Port 1 has been an excellent home for these Kerbals. I'm sure they want to get back to Earth. Okay, let's take a look at the track here as the burn is almost done. Uh, seems like we're on it, right? That, that looks pretty much like where we need to be. We don't need surface info anymore. 
Looks like the burn was done with reasonable accuracy. Amazingly enough. Okay, but uh, let's see what's happening at the Earth end of things. We seem to have an Earth encounter. That's a uh, relief. <laughs> but there we have a nice periapsis into Earth's atmosphere directly, so no mid-course adjustment is necessary. We are recharging. So, Philippe and Newcast, on their way back home, you don't need to worry about these Mars to Earth transfer windows anymore. On the Gemini capsule that they are eventually going to be splashing down in, um, we have this Soyuz heat shield, and in a live stream, in KSV 1.2.2, I saw data on this heat shield that isn't evident here. It says it's a lunar rated heat shield, and up here, these say they're also lunar rated heat shield. Uh, heat shields, so I thought there was no particular distinction between these lunar rated heat shields when I built this mission. But in 1.2.2 there was extra data about heat absorption at, uh, at I think it was 2000 Kelvin, at a specific temperature, how much heat they absorbed. And the Soyuz heat shield was actually rated as absorbing a whole lot more heat. That was displayed on this side here. And we don't have that information here, but it seemed like it would ablate a lot more at a given temperature than the other lunar rated heat shields. So I've got this concern in my head now, because it, apparently not all lunar rated heat shields are created equal. So yeah, I'm yeah. This is this is a problem, if this is true. So let's turn to our mission and talk about what we can do and what I'm going to do about uh, my concern here. Okay, so here we are in Earth SOI. There is Earth, and right now TAC Life Support is rebalancing the food, water, and oxygen, determining how much has been consumed. Uh, here it stays steady, but in these numbers it has to readjust to what this shows here. Uh, so the thing is, we have the two heat shields, but this one has 20% of its ablator. So even though it might have the better heat capacity or uh, heating rate uh, than this one does, this one still has f all of its ablator. This one has only 20%. So that's downside with uh, working with this one. Uh, the heat shield loading should be pretty good on this one, but maybe still not as good as just having the Gemini capsule on the Soyuz heat shield. So that's another question. Uh, another thing is, uh, for some reason, when we were entering Mars' atmosphere, this was unbalanced, and I didn't understand why. Um, everything has been placed on this symmetrically. Uh, there's nothing that hasn't been placed on this symmetrically. Uh, descent mode is off on both sections that have a descent mode, but for some reason it had an issue. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to reshuffle the life support and I'll uh, pump the water and oxygen in here. We don't need to pump the food up because the, the quantity of food up here is actually more than, I mean, the water and oxygen will run out way before the food does. So we'll just leave that be. A note that there is some ablator on the Gemini cabin itself, just in case. Uh, all modules have a little bit. Uh, this one has some too. Okay, so that's there and I'm going to pump this food, water, and oxygen into here to lower our center mass get closer to the heat shield. Uh, let me make sure I'm doing that the right way around because I'm thinking that we're going to try and capture high in Earth's atmosphere like uh, 75 to 80 kilometers using this heat shield. Hopefully that doesn't do too much damage. <laughs> Uh, and then, uh, uh, but not only that, use the engines as well to help capture, but uh, we'll need the atmosphere's assistance for that as well. And then after that, separate and then come down in the Gemini cabin, because we've probably, I, I'm sure that we've brought this sort of thing down from a moonlight trajectory, right? We've sent uh, capsules like this to the moon and back. So I think uh, we can be certain that as long as we use this to capture at a moonlight trajectory, we can then be safe coming back with this. 
So that's the goal. The question is whether I can figure out how to do this without it exploding. So, um, ship manifest, we can dump the waste and waste water, and for some reason right now it's not making any sound, which is interesting. Nice. But still, for some reason, it decided to stop before... Wait, it's paused right now. We do have one other contingency thing that I'm going to introduce. Uh, waste and... Okay, it's just... It's got to be clunky one way or another. Okay, so we've dumped the waste and waste water. We could do that closer to Earth, but uh, we've done that. And we can unlock this locked fuel that I had reserved basically for this sort of situation and pump that down. Again, for the center mass issue, hopefully to help with stability. So, yeah. Then we've got everything looking like this. And the question is whether this is a good configuration or not, and whether it'll survive. What I'm worried about is that uh, this portion is going to explode, and but this will still have its heat shield, and then this capsule only has uh, basically one day's worth of supplies, but like uh, really only three to four hours worth of um, electric charge right because it's not gonna have any solar panels to work with these are all down here uh, so it's going to be in a bad situation as far as supplies and electric charge and if it ends up in too high an orbit like its orbital period is more than four hours or worse more than one day we're going to have a rather large problem if this portion is lost so that is the concern, and uh, in that case, I would like something to rendezvous with it. And that's why I'm looking at possible missions we have already built that could uh, be launched quickly right now. They'll be launched right now into uh, a matching orbit, and then they'd be ready to go to uh, snag this in that situation. Maybe. It'd be hard to do the rendezvous anyway. Because we'll be past periapsis, and they'd like have to do a lot of burning to try and get to it. You know what? I'm nervous about trying to use this heat shield and this whole bulky thing, especially since it had that tendency to tilt in in Mars's atmosphere. There's something screwy about maybe this passenger compartment. I'm not sure. Oh, so the engines could explode. Not that that might be a problem, but I'm not sure. So there's a lot of uncertainty about this whole package. I'm going to try and just aim lower in the atmosphere. Periapsis, uh, 60, 65 kilometers, hopefully will do. And we're going to use the fuel to slow down, but then we're going to separate this off. That's... It's a toss-up what might be the best way to go, really. So, uh, actually, we should change our periapsis. Going to use SAS so that persistent rotation works and we remain facing the sun and don't lose electric charge. The fuel in here is not quite enough to get us a capture. This fuel up here is still locked. We'll unlock it once we separate that off. I mean, this seems like moon-like velocities, which means maybe I should even have the periapsis lower, come to think of it. 65 is usually pretty high for a return from the moon. Okay, um, let's unlock this fuel. Turn orbit normal to get rid of this whole thing. We need to capture into a low orbit, so that's that's a catch. Hmm, it doesn't seem to be turning orbit normal, but that's all right. This this direction is fine by me. Right. We are not using descent mode, and now we're in trouble. Right, the clock is ticking. Electric charge is going down. We have limited food, water, and oxygen. Oxygen is the one that's lowest. Twenty-three hours. 
Okay, we have atmospheric interface and about 11,100 meters per second. I'm going to arm the parachutes now. So, did I make the right decision or should I have gone with the keeping the service module? Well, there's a service module exploding, but that's not indicative of anything at all. Let's take a look at the heat shield ablation rate and everything. It's definitely started to ablate. And we have some effects. Bit of a yaw and pitch thing going here, I don't know why. We've captured. Let me change the camera. And there's a little thermometer reading there. I don't know why there's a yaw and pitch thing. Ablation rate is fine. We uh, seem to have enough ablator. That's good. I don't know whether it would be an okay... Well, wow, why? Why is there all this pitch and yaw? The scent mode is not on right now. But maybe it was the capsule itself that had this problem. See, I mean, this was what I was afraid of with... But I thought it was the big Gemini compartment causing it. Apparently, this has some sort of issue like that. And maybe we'll even come straight down. Uh, our orbital period is low enough now that the electric charge will hold out for a go-around if necessary. And we might still go around, yeah. So not perfect. But it sure as heck could have been worse. Well, that's... That's good. <laughs> oh, God. All right. All right. Well, uh, and we, might, we might still be able to come straight down. It depends. We're, we've passed the flame effects, but there's still some atmosphere left to go. We'll see. Uh, maybe I should turn descent mode on and uh, roll 180 at this point. Oh, that's not helping our periapsis that much. That's too steep. I don't want to have a periapsis of 45 kilometers. So far, 3.7 Gs. We used more than half of our bladers, so... Uh, if this heat shield is anywhere the same as the other heat shield, the other heat shield probably would have lost too much. So yeah, this was the phase I was where if we ended up in the orbital period that was too long for the electric charge, we could have tried using that uh, UDMH depot to catch up to it and grab it. That would have been a tough call, but if you can't do anything else, might as well try. But it doesn't look like we're going to have that problem. In retrospect, slapping on some solar panels on this wouldn't have been a bad idea, but it would take a lot to actually recharge it because it takes two electric charge per second. So just a tiny surface mount solar panels wouldn't be enough anyway. Okay, approaching apoapsis and sure enough we're about halfway through our electric charge. So actually it was less than I thought it was as far as how much electric charge we have. It's actually the reaction wheel responsible for roll in this case. The RCS thrusters aren't really positioned for roll at all. Just going back and forth here. Um, this might not even be the right axis to be going in, come to think of it. Looks like our UDMH and N204 are actually imbalanced on this, which is surprising. Well, I think I can take 65 kilometers. Um, should we have the set mode on? I I think probably at this altitude it's fine. You want a comfortable ride down for Philippa Newcast, I suppose. Our parachutes are armed. Okay, we're at 90 kilometers. I'll have it stop holding pitch. We're at 70 kilometers. Flame effects have started. 7,100 meters per second still. Blader is ablating. So 
be needed more of later, as it turns out. Uh, G-forces are still moderate. We'll see what they peak at. We do have the scent mode on, but uh, it's still getting to 2 G's already. 3 G's. And basically peaking out at 3.5 G's. We are over water, 23 degrees south, 80 degrees east. So Indian Ocean. Whoa, that's sort of early deployment for that parachute, but okay. I did not expect that. Yeah, normally I have it pressure determined. Let me quickly check what the other parachute is at. Uh, 0.25 atmosphere, 700. And this is typical of a main shoot. I usually go for 0.3 atmospheres though, but this is fine. Uh, I'm surprised... Oh, this one had to default. Apparently I didn't uh, do symmetry on it. Well, that sort of explains it. So, our imbalance, the reason why we had that residual pitch in yaw, was because I didn't apply the same stuff to both parachutes. So one parachute was 0.031 tons and the other 0.044 tons. Seems like that's a minor difference but I don't think, I mean apparently it showed up because that's the only asymmetry in this other than if you turn descent mode on. So, yeah. Okay, now both sides are out. Hopefully, it'll be fine uh, as it is, even though they aren't symmetrical. Okay, we have full parachute deployments, and we're at 5 meters per second, so that's good. Okay, here we go. Splashdown, sort of a floaty splashdown, but we'll have to take it. So, Philippe and Ucas, recover. Okay, so that was done. Uh, 1,600 science earned. Parts, we've got parts back, some parts. 13 XP gained from Philippe, and Ucas got 34 XP gained. I wonder why Newcast... Oh, well, Newcast was the one that landed on Phobos and Deimos, right? So, Newcast got extra. Newcast is now level 4. On that note, and with this success, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.